Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. This is the first week of the month. We used to call it first open line first Monday, but I was reminded by so many that there are folk around the world that are watching us live right now and it's no longer Monday, it's Tuesday. And so this is the first part of the month when we use this episode of The Journey Home to open the lines more to your input. So tonight, particularly, your phone calls and emails run this program. And so we're right now, let me give you the phone number, 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. Because I know tonight you're going to want to call us. There's a very, very uh, key part in our history that connects with our guests tonight. Our guest is Daniel Ali. He's been on the journey home before. He's an Islamic convert. Is that right? Or a Muslim convert? I always get it wrong. A Muslim convert. A Muslim convert. I'll make sure I can say it right. Because one is the, like you said, one is the person, one is the faith. Daniel's been on the journey home before. He shared his, his journey. And uh, with him, the last time he was on the program, was Father Pacwa. What are you doing here? Is this Tuesday? How do you split this? You said it was Tuesday, Tuesday night. No, you it's it Monday. Tuesday. No, it's open line first Monday. Oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> can I stay anyway? Why are you here, Father? <laughs> Father joined us last time to help uh, just bring it all about in terms of explaining the issue. And uh, but why are you here tonight? Well, last time Daniel and I had so much fun. Plus. <laughs> In the Middle East, I know how to make the good bribes. <laughs> the next morning, I gave him Turkish coffee, I gave him labne, I gave him khubas, I gave him zatar, and he was, he was putty in my hands. So we started working together. Uh, Daniel and I have been uh, working together since then, as a matter of fact, more directly since uh, January, on making a series of videotaped lectures on how to explain Christianity to Muslims and to do so from within the mindset of Islam. Yeah, yeah. And so, so that we're not coming just as outside, we're trying to understand from the inside. And so that's what we've been doing together. And we've been lecturing together now uh, for a number, since January. You know, that, that verse that opens the second letter of uh, the Corinthians, that talks about we are comforted that we might comfort others. And to me, it always reminds that God chooses people for certain tasks with certain backgrounds, certain experiences. And I, you know, right now, when you think about it, with all that we've experienced in this world over the last two, three, four, five years, particularly in America, with uh, the, uh, you know, more people are thinking about Islam in its connection with our Christian faith than probably in a long time yeah. because of the media. And as you both know, we don't always see the full picture on the media. So America has a strange view of what it's really like in Iraq. And so we're going to talk a little bit about it tonight. But, but I will remind the audience that because Daniel's been on the program before, that you gave your whole story last time. And we want to have more time for phone calls and emails tonight. In fact, I didn't give the email address. Journeyhome at EWTN.com if you have a message. Uh, and what we'll do tonight is I'm going to ask Daniel and Father a few questions. But as soon as we have phone calls and emails that... Uh, are of interest, we'll go right to them. So again, let's start calling in. But Daniel, as I always begin this program, how about giving them a short summary? Remind us about your journey from Islam to the Christian faith. As, uh, as every human being yearns to serve God, to seek Him, to find Him, to embrace Him, uh, Muslims are also had the same uh, encrafted imprinted in their heart love of God and search for him. Being a person growing up in Iraq from an uh, uh, Islamic background, I had interest to, uh, uh, to know more about God. And uh, that's, that journey led me throughout years, 30 plus years, uh, to come to uh, this point uh, where I am a Christian. Uh, of course, it, it goes through periods where you pay attention to the uh, grace of God, yielding to it. Some other times you do not. Uh, but God never ceases to draw you closer to Him and never ceases to reveal Himself to you uh, in your environment, in people you encounter in your daily life, in your in overall in your activities. And uh, 
having Christian neighbors in Iraq, uh, being exposed via education to certain aspect of Christianity, self-studying Christianity, all this brought me up to a point where I, I knew Christ uh, by early 80s uh, as the son of eternal God and God himself incarnate, the second person in the Holy Trinity. Yet that did not come about via missionaries, uh, uh, nor it came via people who spoke Jesus to me, but it came from my own study in the Quran. So in another word, I came to know Jesus uh, through the through Quran, the Quran. Huh. more than uh, 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 from the Bible because I did not pick up the Bible until later on in my journey in life. And that journey led me uh, uh, eventually to meet my uh, precious wife uh, back in my country. Uh, we married over there and uh, we moved then back to uh, this blessed country and uh, until God sees into it that freedom will prevail in Iraq and as everyone knows Thanks be to God and to the GIs and to this government, government of this country, and to the American people who shed their blood in that country for my freedom and the freedom of my people, of which only God knows how much I do appreciate. Yeah, in fact, I, just thinking that, you know, so many of us watched what was happening in Iraq through our televisions, but you were seeing all that from a whole different perspective. It'd be like us being over there watching it happening in our backyards. I'm sure to you it was a much deeper. It was deeper. I, I fought all my life uh, from 1976 until 1991 against Saddam and his regime. I was jailed eight times. Uh, I was tortured. Not, I, I'm no exception. I'm not no hero. Make no mistake about it because that is the fate of everybody who opposed Saddam. So I'm no exception. I didn't do any heroic things. But that was the natural consequences for anybody who opposes Saddam. The regret I had is when I saw that uh, statues coming down, I was crying that I was not there. <laughs> because all my life was heading to that point, and yet I could not be there. But nevertheless, in my heart, in my prayer, yeah. I was there. You know, we in America get such a, only a one side and a very slim view of ir Iraqi culture. And uh, one thing I asked you at dinner, uh, I mean, the funny question would have been, you know, how many camels did you really grow up with? Uh, you might answer that. But also, as I mentioned, you know, we, we in America, we, we'll watch the newsreels and we'll see the streets and full of people, very, very passionate. It's so different than our culture. Talk about, I mean, it's such a different world. Let's uh, talk about the camels. Okay, good. <laughs> How many I, times did you ride camels? None. Okay. <laughs> this is one of the ironies. I've ridden camels a lot. I will teach you. <laughs> well, did you know in Chicago they grow up with camels? <laughs> I didn't know that. Actually, I have not seen camel until uh, uh, I was, I mean, in my teenager life. One time in my life, and that was, uh, people think, uh, they think Iraq is a desert. Uh, the western south part of Iraq is. That's uh, the inhabitable area. But the rest of the country, mountains, green, that's what they called fertile land. Uh, fertile land. It's the, between the Tigris and the rivers. It's green land. It's beautiful uh, land. Uh, and you have to uh, think why God called a person from Iraq to be the father of the faith of all three religions. <laughs> Abraham from Ur. Yeah. Iraq is composed of many nations. Uh, there are, the majority are the Arabs. The second in numbers are the Kurds, my people, the Medes of the Old Testament, and the Magi of the New Testament. And also there are Chaldean, there are Assyrian, there are Armenian. So there is a lot of nationalities and ethnic, ethnic diversity in Iraq and also faith. What you saw as uh, in the media, uh, which I call them certified stupid uh, <laughs> journalists, uh, they pick selectively what yeah. serve their own agenda. I've been in a Norwegian radio station and he asked me how could you reconcile this, all this uh, massive demonstration against U.S. My question was to him how many thousands were there? He said many thousand. I said let us say hundred thousand. He said that's fair. I tell him Iraq is composed of uh, 23 million. 
have you thought to entertain what they think? Mm -hmm. Do you really think that Iraqi people are against U.S.? As a person from Iraq, we have no reason to be. We have no reason. Are there people who mistrust this government? Yes. But are there people who will look for any excuse to enhance the feeling towards U.S.? Yes. Iranian influence among the Shiites in the South, Saudi Arabia and Syria among the Western borders. The people who carries these kind of demonstrations in Baghdad, the imam of that mosque was in the United Arab Emirate. He was working with Saddam against the Iraqi opposition. Why the media do not say that? What I'm trying to say in another word, and keeping in mind also, this is the first time the Iraqi people had the chance and the opportunity to voice their God-given rights without being fear of persecution or being killed or being tortured. You have to understand all Iraqi people were victims of a satanic regime. And those who support that government, directly or indirectly, they were prolonging the suffering of the Iraqi people. Those same people opposed the liberation of Iraq. The Iraqi people had a say in it, and they would hear it loud and clear. And hopefully we'll get balanced coverage of that as we watch the news. By God's now words. you're, um, you, two of you embarked on a 30, 30 plus video series and Christianity and Islam and what a project you're, you're getting involved with? This. Yeah, we've uh, been working together. We've worked out uh, 30 topics, but as we've been going through them and giving the lectures on specific issues, we find that sometimes it takes more than one hour to go through certain issues like what is the meaning of sin and atonement. So we may end up doing 30, more than 30 hours of video because in our approach, we both know and that Daniel himself has come to Christianity by investigating the Quran. And that helps us mm -hmm. to have a distinctive perspective. We're going to approach the Quran and the Muslim people with respect for their desire for God. These are people who have a God-given dignity. And as such, they really seek God. And part of it, Islam is to be very much at God's service. What do I do to obey God is a, a burning issue for Muslims. You know, that's interesting because you'd almost say that in every <coughs> different world religion, that's a kernel that everyone has in their heart uh, as a part of the Imago Dei, the image of God, to find, discover what that is they were created to be, unless mm -hmm. their particular psychology or philosophy yeah. has has drowned is driven that out of their consciousness so you see it and then that's why we need to give them the right information so when they answer that question they answer it in the right way but different face and i was thinking of 30 tapes obviously we can't answer every question tonight uh about differences between christianity and islam but for example why don't you grab an issue that you would say is indicative of a unique perspective between islam and christianity i i personally think <coughs> I personally think it goes back to original sin. Muslims do not believe that I, Daniel Ali, Father Mitch Pakwa, humanity at large, had any relation with the sin of Adam. That is to say, my own sin, my own shortcoming, it's my own, had no effect, had no relation with others. Now, one of the things, too, though, and this is an assumption, Daniel helps to point out, Muslims do believe Adam sinned. Yeah. Indeed. Right. And so that's something we share in common, but as he says, this is where they're different. How it connects to the rest of us. Right. Uh, although although Muslims uh, uh, admit because of the Quran in chapter 2, in chapter 7, in chapter 20, where the narratives of the Adam and Eve and the fall, <clears throat> although they admit, and it is clear, direct quotations from the Quran that Adam, when he sinned, he fall from the grace of God. God cast him out of the Garden of Eden, which is understood in Islamic theology as paradise. He cast him out of the Garden of Eden to, to the earth. 
and the turmoil and the animosity between us and Satan is present. We explain that to the Muslim, but we also explain to the Muslim, if I have no relation with Adam's sin, and I am not responsible, and I have nothing to do with it, how come I am not in paradise? We also explore Muhammad's tradition in that regard. Let's give an example. Muhammad in his tradition says that every drop of blood, every murder committed on the face of the earth, the guilt of which Cain's has. Cain, this, the, the, who killed his brother Abel. Right. That is every crime committed on the face of the earth, Cain is responsible for it. Now, obviously there is a relation. Another uh, uh, hadith of Muhammad. Muhammad hadith is his tradition. It's his words and deeds. In a quotation, in a, 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 a dialogue between Moses and Adam on the gates of heaven, as it goes in Muhammad's tradition, Muhammad's hadith, Moses blaming Adam that because of your sin, our father, because of your sin, we are out of heaven. Now, if I am not related with his sin, obviously Cain would not be responsible for every drop of blood, and Adam would not be responsible for me to be on earth. But obviously because of these two sins, especially because of the sin of Adam, obviously we're paying the price. So the relation do exist. And also Muhammad says, every human being is a sinner by his nature. And the best among and the best among them are the repentant, mm -hmm. those who repent. Clear. Mm -hmm. So by their nature means the nature is falling. Mm -hmm. We explain these things to Muslim from within their own. Do you find sources. that they hear what you're saying that when you We do, we do receive a lot. I mean the last reason I say that is most of us Christians just envision that converting a Muslim is almost near to impossible. As well, from your experiences, have you seen that? As, as a matter of fact, from the, when we did the show with you before, there were two people who made contact with us hmm. about the things that we said. And they both checked, they, they appreciated the respect, and then they checked the facts, and they saw that what we said was true, and they both became Christians. Oh, praise God. And in some of our other lectures, We've had other people, we don't want to say cities and things, because right. one of the, we don't want other people who convert will make their own statement. We won't. But we, we will say that, uh, well, just in given the few lectures we've done so far, there have been a number of people who have listened to what we had to say, and we, we, pose, we pose questions. Uh, tell them about the, just the conversation uh, re regarding Abraham and his children. In a place uh, in the state, I had uh, uh, a lecture, a seminar, <coughs> and a gentleman was present, a Muslim, brother was present, and afterward he came out, and uh, after the seminar he said, Mr. Ali, I really appreciate you respect our faith. You have not stated something we do not believe in. Everything is there. But I am very sad that you are, you know this much about Islam, you became Christian. I told him later on, I shared the same feeling towards him because obviously he knew Islam, but stayed Muslim. <laughs> obviously, we had differences, strong differences, but we are not disrespectful to each other. We could voice our differences. We could strongly voice our differences, but in civilized way, in civilized manner. Nevertheless, he said, well, could you give me an, a reason, one of the reasons? I said, well, in Islam, uh, there is the belief that Ishmael was the son to be sacrificed. He said, yes. I said, okay. And you believe that he is the miraculous son? He said, yes. I said, show me the, way, the how this mir miracle could come about. If Abraham was in the late 70s, Hagar was in 24. Sarah was in the early 70s. She was barren. Don't you know that a man could impregnate women regardless of how old is he? based on the woman's age, he said, that's a fact. At him, then there is, where is the miracle there? Because, but we, yeah, because, and, and the, the, the problem is that Sarah, barren, at 90, has a son, Isaac. 
Hagar, 24, has a son Ishmael, both by the same man. Now, which one is the miracle? <laughs> the woman who's born from the, 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 the child who's born from the 24-year-old or the child born from the 90-year-old woman? And why is it that the son from the 24-year-old woman is the chosen son, but the one from the 90-year-old woman, Isaac, is not? So points, points like that add to it the promise of this yeah. child was given to Abraham, according to Islamic tradition, Muslim theology, was given to Abraham while he was in Ur, in Iraq. That was before he came to know Hagar, when he had Sarah. So the promise given to him in relation to Sarah, not to Hagar. So that point made that gentleman to later on to convert to Christianity. He thought about it, and that's what we, that's what we expect. We, we, these are things for people to think about and consider you know, the, the different claims. And we don't, uh, both of us have a very clear sense, we don't convert anybody. Right. What we do is we present, these are some reasons why we are Christian, we are not uh, Muslim. Like often evangelization is getting the right information, right. making it to people. I mean, it's really what, that's what's sad when, when we don't evangelize is that we're afraid that, oh, we're gonna be embarrassed or whatever it is. So we don't give the information when often they just need the information. <laughs> from a caring, loving soul. We have an email. Let's jump with the email, because it connects with things that you're saying. It comes from Marianne from Pennsylvania. Dear Daniel and Father Paco, do Muslims believe that man is created in the image and likeness of God? God bless you, Marianne. Uh, Islamic theology, theologian, Quran and Muhammad's tradition, specifically and explicitly, they deny that man is created in the image of God. Why? Because they believe to, for, for God to create a man in his image means God's might, God's majesty, God's omnipotency is belittled by putting himself to this finite level. And that the resemblance of man cannot be the resemblance of God. There is a point in it, but it is not solid because Quran also mentioned that, uh, 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 that the word image in Arabic Surah. It is obvious in the Quran that we means we created them in the best picture, which is another word for image. So, but nevertheless, they don't pick on that. They say overall form of Adam was perfected. They don't see it as being created in the image of God. Nevertheless, that is not. I mean, if you deny that you've been created in the image of God, or you admit that, that will not, that will not, it's not big, uh, big in Islamic theology. It's not big for, for the purposes of converting a Muslim. Would, the, would, uh, would Muslims basically put the Quran before the Bible? I mean, in interpretation, would that be the normal flow? Absolutely. Yep, okay. Absolutely. So in other words, if there's a, something in the scriptures like the image of God that doesn't quite fit with the way they understand things, they go to the Quran as the interpreter. Yeah, the, the basic sense uh, on one hand is that the Bible, the, the, the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospel, the Injil, that we have, mm -hmm. have been corrupted. Mm -hmm. that, that would be the basic sense. Mm -hmm. Now, there are the, the couple of things that go, go back, what well, we try to bring up too, because on one hand they'll say that it's corrupted and we don't have the real Gospel, but they will sometimes quote the gospel selectively oh, well, when it supports them yeah. on saying that the, the gospel of St. John predicts the coming of Muhammad. And they'll say that Jesus mm -hmm. said that Jesus is the, the uh, Muhammad will, is the paraclete according to Muslim interpretation. So then we have to have a question for them. And Daniel, what do you say to such a person? Well, if, if, if uh, first this is a new pattern in Islamic apologetic. It did not exist prior to that. Hmm. Now, if you claim that my book is corrupt, that it is not the same divine book anymore, which is the Islamic understanding that the Bible is not anymore the Word of God. Now, having said that, how you allow yourself to pick from it certain texts which fit a certain criteria proves your case. My question to you is this. Do you have a divine knowledge that that text you picked is of a divine source? If that is the case, why don't look at the rest of the text? Add into it 
the Quran stands both. It supports both claims. It supports that the claim it is corrupted, that is the Bible is corrupted, and it also supports the claim that the Bible is not corrupted. Why should I leave this and pick okay. this one? Pick I have to have both in perspective. I used to, I used to pick and choose too, but we won't go there. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Let's uh, take this next email. Uh, it comes from Donna in Massachusetts. Thank you for bringing me home. I would like to know what makes the prophet Muhammad the leader of Islam when they believe that Jesus was a prophet also. Thank you, Donna. I am afraid that I didn't understand I, the question. Here, in other words, what makes the prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. the leader of Islam when they believe that Jesus was a prophet also? So, so in other words, the, the sense is that Muhammad is, is this, this prophet who, uh, as a matter of fact, in Islam, ex is the seal of prophecy, and he's the, the last prophet, the end of and, he's, and he's yeah. superior to Jesus. That would be, now, and the question is why? They believe that he received this revelation from the angel Gabriel, and that this revelation of the Quran is what, what he Did was he given. Did he claim that? Uh, first, the, the reason behind that is this. The reason why Muslims follow Muhammad who was a prophet, and not Jesus Christ, who was also a prophet, is this. First, Muslims believe that the previous scripture, the previous revelations, all were corrupted, altered, and changed from its content. But in addition to that, the Quran came to perfect all previous revelation. And thus, the Quran, in a sense, supersedes the previous revelation. And Muhammad, being the person who God's message was revealed to him via Gabriel, gave him this final, the most perfect of all revelation. Thus, a human being, as one of the pillars of Islamic faith and also one of the articles of Islamic faith, are obligated, and humanity also are obligated, to follow only the example of Muhammad but no other prophet. They honor the other prophets, but honor and respect is something and following up is another. I admit that I've never read the Quran, as probably most Christians, but it does amaze me when a book produced by a single person has such amazing influence on so many millions of people. Is it a, an inspired, a powerful, consistent, coherent book? First, Muslims do not believe it is a production of Muhammad. Oh. They believe that it is the word of God, dictated, as I said, by the archangel, by, by the angel uh, uh, Gabriel to Muhammad via 23 years, from 610 to 632, I'm sorry, 22 years, from 610 to 632 AD. It didn't come all. They didn't come all at once. Gradually. Okay. Now, does the Quran hold the coherency which we see in the biblical right. uh, 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 scripture? Obviously, I personally do not believe that. Otherwise, I would have not been here. <laughs> the Quran, we believe that it contains many discrepancies. The reconciliation between these self-contradictory notions cannot speak of the alleged claimed divine source. That is my perspective, provable by the Quran, which of course the Muslim will not agree in the way I look at it, but that is a way we could sit down and dialogue about it. But it is not outright, I cut you off, you are wrong, I'm right. It doesn't work that way. Well, comment on that problem? No, I, I think that uh, it's something that, in, in terms of the, the other question about Jesus and Muhammad yeah. too, right. um, I think it's important to realize that the Quran says that Muhammad had to ask for forgiveness from God. It also says that Jesus is sinless. Only Jesus and the Blessed Virgin Mary are sinless. And so this is something else that we bring up as a question. As a matter of fact, they believe that Jesus was assumed into heaven alive. He did not die on a cross. He was assumed into heaven alive. Another man who looked like Jesus was crucified. Jesus That's was, what the Quran says. Yes, okay. the Quran and, the, and the, uh, Muhammad's tradition. Okay. 
and that um, in the Quran, in, in, chapter, in Surah 4, chapter 4, verse 157, it says that he did not die. Okay, they thought... Crucified. But, he was, yeah, not, was crucified. not crucified. And that he's <laughs> in heaven. He'll come back at the end of time, and he's going to fight the Antichrist. And then he'll also be married, and then he'll die, and then be raised up from the dead. Now, what's interesting to, to me, and, to, and Daniel also questions, is why is it that Jesus Christ, who is sinless, like his mother, Mary is sinless, why is he coming to fight the Antichrist and not the anti Muhammad? <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a question that we have. Why is, why is it Christ and an Antichrist that are the central figures of good and evil, while well, not Muhammad fighting the anti Muhammad? Hmm. See, this is, this is a question. We, so we, ask, we want to ask these questions and, and engage seriously on that. Okay. Excellent. Let's take a break. We've got a couple emails waiting. I think we have a call. We'll back just a bit with your questions for Father Pacwa and Daniel Ali. Welcome back. Our guests this evening are Daniel Ali and Father Mitch Pacwa. He just had, needed to have one more night on television here. He sleep, slipped over into my program, <laughs> which is great, Father. Uh, you had a comment to continue on that question that we just ended with. The issue had to do deal with uh, the pr uh, Christ and the prophets and the perfection of Jesus versus Muhammad and the yeah, prophets? Uh, yeah, uh, it's on that line. It's on the line, uh, 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 Father Pakwa mentioned that in, in, in Muhammad's tradition, only two souls have never sinned, Jesus and the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then he said, Father Pakwa said about the second coming of Jesus Christ and Judgment Day to kill Antichrist, and then he raised that yeah. question. Muslim theologian, by after the 17th century, they come up with this notion that all the prophets are sinless to combat that point. Right. Now, the problem with that is, one, it had no Quranic support, it had no tradition of Muhammad's support, and it, it, the sins of the prophets are one by one mentioned. I don't mean by every sin, what I mean is sin of Adam is there of Noah is there, of Abraham is there, of Muhammad is there. The only one who is not sinning in the Quran, never sinned, is Jesus. Yeah. What I'm trying to say in another word, that theory which they come about, which is the, among really, among the most fundamentalist Muslims, it came about from Muhammad Abdul Wahab, the founder of Wahhabism. Later, after that, this notion came about, about the sinlessness of the Quran, yet it had no scriptural support, mm -hmm. period. You know, the Quran simply says very cl clearly, each one of those, pro mentions each one by name in different places. Moses had to ask God's forgiveness. Abraham had to ask God's forgiveness. Noah had to ask God's forgiveness. Prophet Adam had to ask God's forgiveness. And so did Muhammad. So they, those are the explicit texts. You know, we, got, we have a caller here, but before we go there, one quick question. Um, you know, in Christianity, we've had a number of schisms throughout the 2,000 years. And, uh, but often in America, we think of Islam, we think of one unified faith. Is that true? That's anything but true. First, the division from the, in Christianity uh, started because the, it, let us say, the Bible, per se, did not exist there. And you had massive geographical distribution where the Christians were around. And there were a lot of heresies around here and there. And it, the subject of, and the nature of the dispute in Christianity is absolutely different than of Islam. But nevertheless, we are not talking about Christianity here. When Muhammad died at 632, he did not say sp explicitly and clearly that such and such should be, prophet, uh, should be the caliph or the agent or my successor. The division in the Islamic world started right there. What we know as the Sunnis, who are the majority in the Islamic world, and the Shiites, who are the minority in the Islamic world, came about from that point. To the, Sunni, to the Shiites, 
the first, the first two, uh, I'm sorry, the second and the third caliph are not legitimate and are not considered caliph, which is one of the pillars in the Sunnis. There is a lot of doctrinal differences. In Shiites, uh, there is temporary marriage. In Sunnis, there is no temporary marriage. The ritual of perform performing the, uh, 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 the prayers are different dramatically in Shiites than that of the Sunnis. Add into it. In the Shiites, there is central authority. In Sunnis, do not. And the Shiites have the infallibility of the 12 Imam, which are the successor, the uh, uh, descendant of Ali, the fourth caliph. Sunnis do not believe in that. So doctrinally, there is huge differences. Nevertheless, they do not, unlike us, they do not scandalize each other as we do in the Christian body. But is there schisms in the uh, 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 Islam? Yes. Why we don't hear about it? Because they literally were butchered. But anybody who studies Islam academically or want to know about the history of Islam, you will find many of them. So. Alawiyya, the, the, uh, uh, the ruling house of Syrian government, are called Muslim, but they are not considered Muslim. Wahhabism are not considered authentically Islam. Nation of Islam is not considered Muslims. Uh, 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 Baha'ism, offshot of Islam, not considered Muslims. Mm. Druzism. Druzism. There is many schools. In the West, we do not have, we do not hear, heard about it because we have not shown the interest in Islam due, the interest due to it. But now we start in fact, to pay even attention. some of the, like some of the Eastern religions in America, we end up with kind of a, an American version of Muslim faith. Yeah. It, you know, that's uniquely American. Right. Maybe even uniquely ethnic in, in a sense. But uh, but maybe no connection. No. To the, okay. All right. Uh, we got a caller. Let's take this first caller from Berkeley, uh, in Florida. Hello, Berkeley. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, good evening, Marcus. Thank you. Uh, I have, it's two part. The first part, very quickly. You mentioned the Blessed Mother, and um, they recognize that she was born sinless. But do they honor her in any way? Is she really any part other than being a historical figure? And the second part. My, I've read a little of the Quran, and my understanding is that when you have conflicting verses, say a more peaceful verse in the early part of the Quran, and uh, maybe one more towards jihad in the later part, that the later verse nullifies the earlier verse. And thank you, thank you for your questions, Berkeley. <coughs> so first, about the Blessed Virgin. Blessed Virgin. First, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary, her sinlessness had nothing to do with her birth. If we gave the uh, uh, impression that's what that's what it was that's not what it is she was sinless but that's explicit in Muhammad's tradition but it is implicit in the Quran that she was born immaculately is as we uh, in Catholicism have uh, the immaculate conception that's present in the Quran implicitly it's not agreed upon interpretation but nevertheless the interpretation as far as we are concerned it is there second part of the question what to do with the earliest uh, 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 chapters or surahs of the Quran nullifies the later. If we speaking chronologically, that had, I mean, if we, if we agree on the premises the caller stated, that have no theological ground in the Quran. There is something in the Quran called nullification theory. Nullification theory, the essence of is that God abrogates whatever he desires. But those fall into two categories. Falls in the category of dogma, but not of events. So we have to be clear about that. That's having said that. Do the earliest surahs in the Quran nullify the latter ones? The answer is not always. In fact, she had mentioned it was the other way around. The, the later nullifies the earlier. Not, not, that is not the case for okay, right. that's not the, so We have to uh, state that Quran is not chronologically arranged. Right. What you know as surah or chapter 1 was not the revealed the first one. Chapter 96 was revealed the first one, chronologically. Hmm. So for you to look at the development of the doctrine or the shift in theology, you have to rearrange the Quran chronologically for you to get to that point. But to abrogation basis, 
or premises in Islamic theology is not based on the which one is earlier than the other. It had many other grounds. You know, it's interesting, Father, that that's not uh, a problem or an issue that's solely related to the Quran. In Scripture, the, in terms of theology, different opinions, uh, what about Exodus, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, what about now in Christianity? And mm -hmm. I, to me, the bottom line is that's why we need an authority. That's why we need a church to help us understand how to take an Old Testament and a New Testament and that's part of the problem I would say in, in Islam is that there is no Holy Father, there is no magisterium that guides the interpretation of Scripture. That would especially be true in Sunni Islam. There's not a central authority to make that interpretation. In Shiite Islam, there's more of an authority for making interpretations. That's where the role of the Imam comes in and the, the succession of the 12 Imams, they have more authority. But the authority of Muhammad's tradition and of the Quran, these are uh, what a person has to interpret. And this is something, again, as you, as you say, in Christianity, we not only have the text of the uh, scriptures, we have Jesus teaching, and, and he's the one who says, you have heard that a knife for nine, a tooth for a tooth, but I say, mm -hmm. no, you love your enemies. But then also, the church itself is given authority. See in Acts of the Apostles. Peter is given a vision that allows the eating of any food in Acts chapter 10. And so this is something that continues on you know, uh, in the church as well. You know, I was thinking my, my Calvinist background, they off, we often put Paul above Jesus in interpreting scriptures. You know, if Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5, 6, 7 in Matthew, but it doesn't jive with the way we understand Paul explaining Christianity. We would say, well, Jesus, is, what he was speaking at the time was kind of plan A, but now that Jesus was dead and resurrected, now we're in plan B. And so Jesus was speaking to kind of an Old Testament people, uh, trying to encourage them to earn their way to, to heaven. But since you couldn't do that, now Paul gives us plan B. Well, again, that's not what the church teaches. That's not what tradition has taught. But that's what one particular uh, tradition has run with the scriptures, in which you're saying that even there are different traditions within Islam that will probably take the Quran and, and make it fit their own, their own angle. A yeah. human being had the tendency to justify the ways and the means he <laughs> or she would understand things. I mean, you will yeah. make the water run upward. Yeah. <laughs> then goes down. Yep, yep. We got another caller, Carolyn from Louisiana. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Yes, thank you so much for the program. Um, I was wondering, um, in light of everything that y'all have said, what is it that makes Islam so appealing to people? Thank you, Carolyn. Simplicity. That's what makes it appealing. It is very simple. You have do's, you have do nots. You do not have original sin, you do not have redemption of sins, you do not have uh, redeemer, you do not have all this theological complexity which is an essence of Christianity. In Islam, you do not have that. In Islam, uh, you just say there is no God but God and Muhammad is prophet. You are automatically, of course, not that uh -huh. simplistically, but you have with sincere, sincerity. You are automatically Muslim. Yeah. The simplicity of the dogma is one main attraction. Mm -hmm. Having said that, does that mean Islam do not contain complexity? The answer is no. It had com uh, complexity. Fur furthermore, we have to understand also that not necessarily based on the simplicity or complexity people convert to Islam, but sometimes out of dissatisfaction with the Christianity. Mm -hmm. The scandals is one main thematic problem. Uh, uh, we see it in, in, in our world. I, as a person who grew up from Middle East, uh, uh, we have very strong emphasis on moral and morality that sh cannot be accepted from a religious figures, ha what have you. Those for certain people, it, is, it causes a difficulty in their faith. But the unfortunate thing, they turn this difficulty to a doubt. And that doubt to conversion. And totally, because dissatisfied with a first f f performance of certain religious group, that 
generates an anger, and that anger is translated by converting to other faith. Again, but that does not mean everybody like that, but yeah. this is one of the reasons. What, a, what about when, when Muslims see their own leaders doing inhumanities towards humanity, when they're doing cruelties in their leaders? Do they not see that as a scandal? They see the scandal, but you have to understand also the mindset is that God allowed that tyrant to come about. So it is part of God's overall plan. Also, th there's another perspective, too. There are some parts of the Quran in which you are allowed to do harm to somebody who attacks Islam. And so it, the leader might seem scandalous to outside, but from the perspective of some Muslims, not all, because again, there's, there's no such thing as all Muslims saying this. But you know what we, we know from bin Laden, he, he makes a point that this is an insult to Islam to have American troops on Arabian soil, mm -hmm. which is their holy land. And so it's not considered an atrocity. It's considered a legitimate way to get the Americans out. Mm -hmm. So this, this, these perspectives vary within Islam as to whether it's even a bad thing. There is another point, actually, we have to make clear of. And that is, in this country, there is free media. People speak up their mind. You see more reports about crimes than about decencies. You hear more, more reports about what have raped than how many prevented rapes. You hear more about evil than about goodness. There is a spiritual battle there. That free realm of media do not exist in the most of Islamic world. Hmm. You have to understand also, do they know their government is tyrannical? Yes, they do. Do they know it as in details as we do? No, they do not. And also you have to understand endurance and patience is part, one major part in Islamic personality hmm. that you have to endure patiently because God this is what's going on is part of God's overall plan. It's a mystery, but it's absolutely okay. Let's take our next caller, Stacy from Ohio. Hello, Stacy. What's your question for us? Hi, um, I have. Uh, well, at work there are a couple of uh, Muslim workers or employees there, and I've been hesitant to approach them for fear of offending them. Um, I really want to be friends with them, and I was wondering if you could offer me. Um, any advice about a, a, like an acceptable way to approach them? Thank you, Stacy, for your question. We have to we have to understand uh, conversion is administered as Father always says. Uh, we are in sales department. God in the administration is management. Management. management department. <laughs> and, and conversion is a management issue. That's up to God's right. grace. <laughs> but you have to be prayerfully, prayerfully, seeking the ways and the means for God and the Holy Spirit to guide you to the appropriate means and methods to approach your colleagues. Having said that, do they like you are ashamed or, I'm not saying ashamed, or hesitant because you do not want to lose their friendship? Are they likewise? And also we have to understand the other part of the matter. In the process of being hesitant to evangelize, actually I am directly declining Christ because the scripture clearly says whomsoever deny me before men him will I also deny before my father in heaven mm -hmm. whomsoever confesses me before men him will I also confess before my father in heaven now that does not mean being disrespectful to people mm -hmm. that's not part of Christianity period, mm -hmm. period. Right. but be firm with respect and earn the right to be heard with love absolutely I mean, you, you build relationships and yeah, I think it's very important to try to understand what their perspectives are and try to talk to them about what they think of Christianity. Ask them, talk to them, without ever being afraid. Uh, in no way should you just back down. Like Daniel mentioned in his earlier story, when the man said, I'm very sorry that you know so much about Islam and you are not uh, a Muslim. And he responded back, I'm sorry that you know so much about Islam and you are not a Christian. <laughs> now, you meet them eyeball to eyeball with still liking them and respecting their perspective, but willingness to engage. And again, this is the other thing we're trying to do, mm -hmm. is give the people of this country 
concrete tools on how to understand the Muslim perspective, the issues in the Quran, and how you can respond to each one. So know something about the Quran first, as well as your Bible. Go ahead. Well, we have an email here. We, sure. Uh, well, we run with this, and, and then uh, this comes from Ron. Uh, do the Muslims have something like a counterpart to the Mass? In other words, there's some kind of ritual. Because we do see images of Islamic ritual when we watch television. Uh, well, the question says counterpart. counterpart. Con counterpart to the mass. Uh, well, there, uh, uh, the question lays the promises as though there is like mass going on in Islam. Yeah. That does not exist. Ritual, these are different. Uh, uh, as the church is a holy place for us, the mosque is a holy place for them. We have different ways of performing our faith and exercising the, and regulating the way we communicate and worship to God. They have different ways of communicating. Rituals are different, no theological commonality in between. You know, when I think of Jesus, we were going to ask uh, a question earlier about you know, the difference in understanding Jesus between Islam and Christianity, and, and you, you started to talk about that. And I was also thinking, maybe as a, a final thought here, um, understanding Christ in your journey, you've come from one category of seeing him a certain way. And now you're understanding him a different way. And I'm wondering if you were talking to a Muslim who might be watching, or Stacy, who has a friend who's a Muslim, tell them now how you understand Jesus in relationship to how you understood him before. In Islam, Jesus Christ is a prophet. That's clear cut. Everybody, almost unanimously, humanity, everybody knows that, uh, that Islamic belief. But that is not the only thing attached to Jesus. The preparation attached to the birth of Jesus is never shared, not even by Muhammad's birth. The qualities, the nature of the mission with which Jesus came about is not shared by Muhammad. The importance given to Jesus Christ, not just to his person, the echoing Matthew, uh, uh, I think 16, 19, uh, uh, who do people say the Son of Man is? That's a question of identity, not of nature. In Islam, the dispute is about not just the nature, but also the identity. But nevertheless, in Islam, there is enough information. It leads you to believe this Jesus Christ had something far more important and prominent than Muhammad. You need to read those. Get in touch with us, and we'll be glad to give you the material. It helps you to understand and share better that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ with the Muslim brothers and sisters. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us in Journey Home. God bless. Father, I'm going to ask you to give us a blessing before sure. we end. Sure. And Almighty God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he direct you in all your ways by his peace. And I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you both for joining us. And again, uh, there'll be information you'll see on the screen about this project, Christianity in Islam, from Ignatius Productions. Productions yeah. And you should find an email address. Yeah. If you can go to fathermitchpacwa.org. Fathermitchpacwa, one word, dot org. Right. The well-known Father Mitch Pacwa. Father Mitch Pacwa. <laughs> Is it F-R? No, uh, Father spelled out. Okay, Father Mitch Pacwa. Dot org. If you missed that, you can go to the Coming Home Network dot org, uh, chnetwork.org site, get information. But thank you for joining us in the Journey Home. I hope this has been informative to you and give you especially something to pray about for the Islams and for those of us that work with Islam, that we might be ministers and witnesses to them through our words and through our lives. God bless. See you again next week.